Okay. There's next talk. Please be silent. Okay. This will get an interesting thing. Normally I'm used to move my arms a lot while I'm talking, so I try to get the microphone always close to my body now. Um, I will give you some information about the ELISA project. ELISA stands for Enabling Linux and Safety Applications. And maybe a quick question up front, who is aware of safety critical software? So shortly raise the hand. Hi. That's good, maybe 25, 30%. That's, I hope you will also learn something new then. So um, maybe before we start fully, I just give you a short view on uh, in which project context I'm working. So as you can see, um, my project is mainly focusing on embedded IoT Linux at Bosch. And what you try to do is utilizing a lot of open source projects, see how they fit into a landscape and can be of value for a very, very different uh, device classes because uh, normally you believe, don't believe it, but in all of these kind of products, you will find Linux in there or also embedded real-time OS and so on. So that's all about this part, shortly about myself. Who am I? Um, I'm a technical business development manager. I'm focusing on embedded open source mainly, doing this for the Bosch. And in parallel, that's also why I'm speaking here. I'm uh, the technical steering committee chair and working group lead for the Linux Foundation Elisa project. I bring a past history of 15 years plus. I guess I started in uh, with Ubuntu 6.10 more or less to set it up on old PCs, sharing it to exchange students, so like a distributed hub of PCs. And uh, here since 10 years, I'm more or less in the automotive space with Linux. We had our first product with 2.6 kernel out. And um, yeah, I guess now we can start on the real things. So if we talk about Linux in safety critical systems, we first need to get an understanding of what a system really means. And a critical system, maybe at first you say assessing whether the system is safe requires understanding sufficiently. And you can see here's nothing about Linux in there because a system always goes beyond the scope of a pure operating system because beyond uh, maybe a single component. And in this one, you have a system context in which Linux plays a role. And you need to understand the system context and how this is used, because if you don't get the understanding how Linux operates, you cannot see in which components you're interested and which features you may need or which not. And then you can evaluate what kind of these features are really relevant for safety. And while you're doing so, you will most likely identify gaps that exist, uh, and you'll definitely need more and more work to get this done. So if you look into the Linux ecosystem, which we have already, there's a good chance that's, or a good reason also to uh, take Linux, because there is a large variety of devices. The ecosystem is strong. You have good tools around this. Uh, an incredible amount of hardware support. It runs on many, many devices. And also very important, you have a broad set of experts in there. If you see what's sometimes taken as the benefit of a yeah, certified safety critical OS, often it comes with hard real-time requirements and capabilities. We know that the preempt RT patches are in good shape and in the kernel, but um, well, hard real-time maybe goes even further down the road. And then there is a development process. And if you see these two sides, if you come and want to address very complex products like in the automotive field, or uh, maybe you can even call your robot vacuum cleaner a more complex product, and then you come from two perspectives. On the one side, you could go with a traditional small component driven Artos, and you have to handle all the complexity. So you need to have more hardware involved. You have more have multi-core support. Suddenly, not everything works out there. Or you go the other way around and you come with a Linux where you all have these kind of things, but you need to improve and see what do we do about the development process, what do you do about the real-time capabilities, and so on. So anyway, when you build a more complex product, you need to find a way to tackle these kind of challenges. And yeah, also bring the difference closer to each other. While we were looking at Linux, I'll take the part in the beginning. It's a little bit like a disclaimer and a little more text. Um, 
in this collaboration of ELISA, we said we cannot engineer your system to be safe. We're talking about functional safety, not about cybersecurity, but if we just take this example, there's always a strong risk also that you have security breaches in your system. So it's similar here also with safety. If you build a system, it's still your responsibility for it, and just because we provide certain guidelines or engineering principles and so on, it's still in your responsibility as someone producing a product to make things safe. And also that to make sure you really have the um, prescribed processes in use, use the methodologies, and one of the core questions which typically come is like, oh, so you're from Elisa, you make a safe Linux, will you certify a kernel version? And that's not what will work because we all know you have to move forward. Uh, there's continuous improvement there, sync, and there are vulnerabilities fixed, so you need to go on. And this gives an additional challenge, which is the continuous certification. So we will definitely not have a version, and we will also not certify Linux in this project. We just give the tools and other elements in there. So here, yeah, last part of it, there's still responsibility, legal obligations, liability, and so on, which is also in your role. Nevertheless, we find a good set of partners already which are willing to support this mission and uh, they subscribe and say we would like to bring the whole thing forward and seeing this there is the um, mission statement which we have drawn. It's lengthy basically you can read that there's a set of elements, processes, tools. It should be amenable to safety certification. We look into software and documentation development and in the end that we aid the development, deployment, operation or the adoption of a project into another project. Okay, so um, if you look at this mission you see basically four key parts which we will also take, talk later about. You have elements and software which is concrete implementation of what we're doing and you also have the processes a development process always falls into safety critical, into security system, wherever you look at. And if you start to automate things, if you would like to analyze, there's always a strong involvement of tools in there. And the last thing is, when you do all this kind of work, you need to document it. And actually there's a lot of documentation work needed in any place. So how do we do all this kind of things? Um, we take it in our ELISA working groups. We split this depending on different topics, on different contexts, they're growing depending on demands. If certain size is reached, we're extending this. And um, yeah, if we take a first look, we have a safety architecture work group. This is a group which actively looks inside the kernel and um, takes, for example, a watchdog subsystem because watchdog is one of the crucial elements which we have in use. It looks what are potential safety related functionality. Is there something in the kernel which is non-safety related? How would these kind of things interfere? And by this, the safety architecture work group does a lot of analysis, uh, try to improve documentation in the kernel, provide new tools. So that's a strong set in there, basically driven by use cases and demands of products. And a little more broader approach is brought in by the uh, Linux features. And actually the full name is Linux features for safety critical systems. So it's not about generic features, it's about the safety criticality part in there. Um, you can imagine this a little bit like if you're familiar with security measures like namespaces or other parts that we're looking for elements in here which could improve safety. So which means if you take this special kernel configuration, a feature, turn it off on whatever you do and say, okay, this is a, will come up as a blueprint. This is something how you better work with memory, how you not work with memory. Um, all these kind of things are tackled in the Linux features. And then it's a nice group because with the results which are in there, if you're already in a process of enhancing Linux and don't want to wait for all the results of the use cases work group and so on, you can have incremental steps here, just take some part of it and make your system more robust, more dependable, and you can also judge it against how does it compare to security things which you're doing. And um, so here, that's that the big value of this group. It's more on a direct use base and serving a long-term safety argumentation, but not, um, that it's something which develops for years, so it's basically assess what's there. 
Um, as also the improvement of code quality is very important, we have uh, tools investigation code improvement work group. The code improvements could be, for example, done with uh, doing fuzzy testing on the kernel using tools like Code Checker or Syscaller, and then bring them also into a setup where we have a server kind of a CI which runs on Linux Next or whatever kernel configuration to identify issues to get the kernel more robust, more dependable, reliable, and serve also in the argumentation about the quality of the kernel. And here, if what was also on the right side and some of the challenges part was on the engineering process. And as you know, there are rigorous methods within the kernel development. So there are a lot of reviews, uh, patches are rejected, and you see that there's strong demand from traditional project management when it comes to safety products and not every process complies with it directly so we need to find an argumentation how is there an equivalence to the open source development process compared to what for example an ISO 26262 requests for automotive products. On top what is very interesting to understand here is uh, also that if we look into open source you basically cannot easily buy uh, maintainer or developer there so you cannot buy features directly or um, so you get more an unbiased view or maybe a personal view but a maintainer who is really committed for the component for this power subsystem of the kernel and so on and with this strong commitment for example you already fulfill a little bit of independent view because in safety systems whenever it comes later on the developer needs to commit to what has been done, but of course it's not written down. It's not written down, the maintainer fully commits to whatever it does. So um, this is some part, for example, where you can start argumenting on it. And as the different elements need to get somewhere and need to be visible, we figured this out because we were running quite in parallel with different streams on this, but never brought this forward. We came up with the systems work group, and the system work group actually should take all these different elements, bring them together, works cross-functional and maybe even cross-project, and uh, combine the elements. In order to tailor the system properly, we have vertical use cases, a newly created one, so there's not much information in this presentation about the aerospace workgroup yet. Uh, the overall idea is it should address everything which flies, and you know that in aerospace there are many safety standards, safety integrity standards, various levels in there. What you may not know, and that's at least what we have heard so far, was there is already Linux in use, and also in certified product there is Linux use, but it's only on, on a very low safety level, so it's not on a very higher upper level of safety certification. Um, what's an obvious thing, if you see the member there is like 50 to 60 percent is from the field of automotive, and therefore we have an automotive use case in there. Um, if you drive a car, if you have a scooter or whatever, you may see sometimes that there's an oil pressure sign, uh, oil temperature sign, check engine, whatever. Basically, when you put on the ignition, you can see all these little LEDs. And this is also the use case which we are using in the um, automotive work group. So basically, what we said, digital or cluster, instrument cluster, the speedometer, everything becomes digital. Everyone has a display in your cars. And that gives a good chance because there are more complex systems in there, a lot of um, rendering, graphics rendering involved. And this is actually a safety critical function. Even the, if you are in driving or in rear gear mode, this has to be properly displayed and it has a safety criticality assigned. Also showing the check engine part is a safety criticality. Um, the third group which we have is from the medical devices. and. Here, this is something from a completely different perspective. While automotive has the commercial element in mind, maybe want to have cost savings, driving topics forward, with the open APS, APS, the artificial pancreas system, um, it's driven by open source. So there were open standards. There were chances to interact with your insulin pump. And you see that this can become very uncomfortable. So there's a nice TED talk from Dan M. Lewis. I recommend this. I put the link also in the slide deck. You can download them and, and check it. You can see that um, yeah, you basically need to track your glucose level and set a dose of your insulin depending on your glucose level. And this is also with warnings and so on. And it's very basically tr event triggered. So you see the blood pressure gets up. 
sugar level goes up. So you set the dose, it has a certain delay until it reacts. And what came in here was to add a Raspberry Pi in the middle, writing some scripting around it, getting it stabilized, and um, create a product out of it. And why I want to stress this is this is not to any IEC ISO certification done. It was done by an open source engineer, started this project, and if you download this, if you use it, you use it on your own risk. And therefore, the work of Elisa was, it was basically also the first use case we put directly in the beginning of the workshop to say, let's take a deeper look, let's analyze what's in there. It's running for thousands of people. It has never been certified. They are very happy, and they see it's increasing quality of their life but it's not certified. It's a safety critical product, not certified, and we are not targeting to do the direct certification of it in the first step. We are looking into the different levels of the analysis, see what is involved, what workloads are in there. Is there something which could make this fail? Is there a risk in there? What potentially could go wrong here? Yeah. And this is basically the completion of the use cases. And uh, I've drawn this basically together. As you can see an inner part, which is very common for almost all the different projects which uh, get fed then by the use cases, feeding and say this is how you need to configure, how you need to specialize because you cannot create a full safety critical item completely out of a context. You cannot have this generic safety argumentation. You always need to judge it towards assumed context. And this then turns into ELISA deliverables. Um, a little bit on another view here, you can see also an exemplary system architecture mainly how we triggered it in the uh, systems workgroup. It's not only Linux involved in these right, this products. So if you come and you, of course, in the medical devices, open APS system, it's a pure Raspberry on it. Um, there is not the direct artist involved if you don't treat the sensor or the insulin pump as the artist next to it. Um, but if you come to more complex products, you always need to face that there are artists involved. There are microcontrollers, microprocessors. Um, container technology come into picture. Everybody talks about containers and embedded these days. And also virtualization technologies, that be Xen or that be uh, KVM. So this is something which gets in there easily. And for this part, if you see on the working group side, um, this Linux features architecture code improvement, this directly go into the Linux work. So the main outcome of this is for the Linux ecosystem, the Linux kernel, and a lot of this work is also not directly related to the hypervisor or the RTOS. But there are things also um, which going a little bit further, like the tools and the engineering process, things which are coming out there may also have a good value for other projects which you build on. So if you have a Yocto involved in there, you can build, uh, for example, Xen and Zafire also with a meta layer. And uh, then it may be good to have these tooling parts in there. Or also code improvements can come into picture there. Um, certain tools which we make use of in your CI for testing, OpenQA system or others. This is an element to be considered here. And lastly, the use cases to for the completeness, they basically tailor down this system to whatever you need. So for example, in the automotive work group, we for now tailor the system down for getting a better Linux kernel understanding and we get rid of the idea originally from the container, the virtualization, the authors. But we know once we have solved some parts of our work, we need to get the system context and the system context involve all these kind of things. Right, and saying this, uh, we also do a certain outreach to other projects. So I put in the uh, Zephyr community, we have the Automotive Grift Linux, which is already in there. Um, there could be other Linux versions, and yeah, also strong involvement of the Octo project. And so I didn't know where to put the SPDX pro <laughs> probably on this picture, but we see it later on. Um, how we interact so far, we already are in discussions with Zephyr and Xen. We have weekly meetings also where uh, Xen members pop up, where Zephyr is present with some representative and we saw that these are safety critical open source projects. So they basically save the, share the same burden. They need to show how the development process is done. How do we guarantee certain quality levels? Where is the testing done? Where are the requirements management and the traceability to everything? This is something which pops in there quite good. Um, 
if we take this architecture, and as I'm coming from the automotive part, we have different projects which share these architectural sorts. And there's a large group on the Eclipse SDV project, there's a SOFI initiative from ARM, basically having similar members like the SDV, and then we have a large automotive grade Linux, uh, which also is so nice to provide us with the reference implementation for the automotive use case. So they share very similar architectures. Uh, lastly, not directly related to safety, but uh, having safety considerations in there and being part of the system is the Octal project for some build tooling part to get this into a CI reproducible. Here, for example, the S-bomb generation suddenly uh, plays into the game, which you can do with the Octal project. And while we were discussing, we figured out that there's also like uh, data needed into a system S-bomb, and for this we reached out to the SPDX, and there's actually a SPDX special interest group on FUSA meeting weekly to extend this scope. I guess there's also later on a uh, talk where parts of it get presented. Right, why do we do all this? Uh, I like this statement from George Bernard Shaw. He said, if I have an apple and you have an apple, if we exchange the apple, we have still one apple, but if I have an idea and you have an idea, and we exchange these ideas and we have two ideas and that's basically where it goes about. We need to get a good understanding, we need to bring the things together and by this we of course need to look into certain activities. So now we come into the part what the different work groups do and if we check for example the um, elements, process, tools, documentation, not every work group acts in the same amount as the others do. So just put some bubbles in here to see uh, where our mainly our work is going. So we have a lot of things, of course, on the software part, the people are interested in the Linux kernel, and the process part is maybe not so strong because it needs to be centralized, and the usage of this process goes into the other work groups. So the OSAP, the medical part, architecture a little bit also, they work on these kind of processes and bring this into the other work groups. Tools seem to be pop out on multiple work groups because uh, Tools are handy, tools pop up, you bring it into the into a repo, you might tell about it, get it used, and if we want to go into continuous certification at some point of time, there will be a need of having a lot of tool support in there. And basically every work group does documentation. Um, I want to give you some examples on this. Um, from the process perspective, there's a system theoretic process analysis. That's the first topic I will tell a little bit more about. So it's uh, the dry stuff about the system's architecture. It's not the code level on this. Um, but we figured out when you do this kind of SDPA analysis, at some point of time you reach also a level where you need to understand more about the kernel. So I'll tell you something a little bit about the workload tracing which we have done. And uh, also here supporting from the another work group, we have a call tree tool that's self, not basically utilizing tools and improving them, but writing something also from scratch. Um, and this all then later on fits into the Meta Eliza, which is basically the Yocto layer for the automotive use case, enhancing the automotive grade Linux demo. All right, we also did something without modification, like the code checker implementation syscaller. I will not tell that much about it, but just should give some examples where we work on. And all our information is public, so we are quite spread it up, so there's a GitHub part, there's some parts on G Drive, we do regular blog posts and have some white papers published, so it always depends on whom do you want to have as audience or readers, so we share this, there's also YouTube channel, but I don't judge this as uh, documentation. Okay, as said first, we look into STPA, so uh, STPA stands for System Theoretic Process Analysis, What's interesting to see is um, if you're coming from safety criticality, maybe automotive, you know, hazard analysis, risk assessment, FMEAs, you may grow with watch, spreadsheets, drawing cases, uh, checking your API interfaces and all these kind of things. And the nice thing about the SDPA is you go a little bit more in a graphical approach, like on the left part of the picture. Some basics here. Uh, it's still relatively new. I say this because the old analysis part come from microcontroller worlds up down to the 60s, 70s, I guess 70s is more or less. So there was a long time where a lot of these analysis techniques came in and they haven't been much improved. But the systems which have been analyzed have increased complexity and this is something which need to be considered. And this system, theoretic process and STPA, is able to handle very complex systems. The reason for this is 
that um, you can start from a quite broad view and maybe you don't know all the elements so you have something you could just get a name for it you don't know how it really looks like and you have another blob where you have more details so you can connect all these different blocks and this analysis will still survive even if you know not the whole block of some specific part yet and then you will go uh, in a very iterative approach and just go there step by step. You figure something out, you go to one level down, going deeper into the system, figure out that your assumption didn't hold true. So you do these kind of things for the analysis. And what's also good, if you have certain analysis, it basically looks on an API level, it looks under definitions or so, but this one explicitly goes on the system context and it includes human interaction, the human operation, and this is also what's not there for other parts. Um, in parallel, you directly get a good, while you do the analysis, you already improve your documentation, you get a good stand, standing of the system, and you can even, if you are in a QA department, so you can even integrate it properly with existing systems, model-based approaches. Right. The principles of it, to get the very, very high level, um, it's quite easy. There are four key elements. There is the controller on top. This one sends uh, a control action to a controlled process and this provides typically a feedback. Well, that's not enough. In the end, there's also important to know that the controlled process as such may also control something else. So that's how things get more grown up. And the question now in the end is, what could go wrong? What are unsafe control actions? You can use this methodology for uh, maybe understanding how your water pipes flow in a building or uh, how people walk through certain, so you can always attach it to whatever use case you like. It's always the same approach, but for our case, and the main idea of it was for safety, criticality, for risk assessments, and that's why we say, let's look under unsafe control action. A little bit of warning, and the next slide is in a way that you will not read. It's a level one analysis of this open APS use case, and, well, yeah, that's how it looks like. In the middle, there's the open APS system, uh, you have a view from the top level, so it's a developer view, it's not the full user view here, so you have infrastructure people, you have algorithm developer, you release the software, then there comes the human operator who uses the software, installs it further on, this goes in the system, we don't know yet what the system is, this is what I meant with the very first level, you don't care if it's a Linux system or whatever is underneath, you just, so this is my open APS system. And when you have understood what is your critical part in there, how the system context looks like, you may go into the next level. And now we zoom in into this open APS system and go on the next level. And in this, you see that there's an, actually a Raspberry Pi involved. We know this from the hardware part and the OS in there. So it's a Raspbian. You have an open APS toolkit involved, the actual algorithm. This may control the insulin pump. Uh, the Knight's code part is also an external equipment, and you see all these kind of things. And the work group has been on this level for some time, and then tried to write down the next level, going deeper, and then actually needed support. So that's where workload tracing came into picture. Uh, we used the mentorship project here and had support, so someone fully concentrating on the activity of workload tracing. That's another little table which you cannot read, uh, therefore, the main things to be known is we use S-Trace and C-Scope as the main tools for the analysis. Uh, there are stressors in there like stress and G, PAX test and other parts. This may depend on your workload which you use once you would challenge with the system. And in this one, the information which is coming in there are system calls. How often are these co system calls coming in, the frequency of it? Which subsystem do they belong to so that you know, okay, where is my critical parts? Where is the system call entry point? And by this, you can more deep dive into the different system. And this causes a lot of refinement into the upper layers again, because now you have iteration and see maybe you have a wrong assumption, but still before everything was correct as you understood, now you just improve it. Related to this calls out the call tree tool. Uh, that's something basically rewritten and own part. So the idea was to see here is a system call, what else of course, what are the ways, how to interact there, how to visualize things, because if you just see something and grow through the code, you cannot really grab the complexity. And uh, this was just the first shot, so also here, it's not worth to read, but you can see there's a file system part, and the very interesting part is, this is quite a static thing, so you will see all the 
potential options. While in the previous view, if you have a call, uh, if you have the workload tracing, you basically see where has the pass gone, but you don't directly uncover the untraced passes. And here you see all the passes, but you have the par chance that you meet something completely irrelevant because you're not on this with your workload. And this is a or complementing element of this. And well, you get a good insights on the kernel construction and it can help you to analyze more workload in there. Right. We bring all these things together in the uh, Meta ELISA instrument cluster. Um, it looks like the AGL instrument cluster. We saw this picture before. I highlighted the change which we did. We write danger in there and this made us the whole thing safe, which, well, is of course not the full story. The full story is that uh, we just needed a use case to which we can analyze, which has safety relevance. And uh, it was a good QT-based demo, so we could make use of it. It was running on QAMO. Um, QAMO has a little bit of drawbacks on this. I'll come to this very soon. But um, with this, you can start analysis tracing workloads and also add a watchdog mechanism. Yeah, watchdog would be the next part of it. Um, basically, what we make use of in a lot of concept is an external watchdog. Even if you don't see it directly in the open APS system, for example, there's still an external monitoring involved which gives emergency data if uh, the Raspberry Pi would do something wrong in the one or the other direction, not that it happens, but there is a monitor there which controls, which will give a beep or so and inform the user. Similar, you do it in uh, the automotive case where you have this telltale environment and you want to have something which is traced in your workload. So, um, yeah, this challenge response watchdog, challenge response makes basically it's not simply looking for something, but it gives a little challenge um, to the workload while the workload process, uh, process other parts and it gets a response in there so that you know, okay, yeah, that's really alive and it's not just replying and it's the demand here comes basically that we, for a lot of use cases, cannot fully guarantee that the workload comes in the proper time that a process doesn't hang and this releases a lot of responsibility from you by checking this with an external workload. And it's mainly looking into the safety critical workload. I know there are ideas to say, well, let's put this watchdog thing and let's watch everything in there. This typically doesn't work out. So you really concentrate on the things and say, this is safety critical and all the other parts are related to user experience. So if you're drawing rendering engine and God's lucky and you see a lot of delay in touch screen or whatever, that's nothing which you want to experience from a user perspective. But as long as the warning signs come in time and in proper from a safety perspective, this is all fine. So it's good to split up here between what is the intended functionality, what is the safety criticality of it, what do I need to monitor and what not. And for this, this is just the safety net in there. Here yeah, I said this is used widely in automotive. There are other industries basically always have your safety net somewhere around which monitor things. And what we try to do is we want to get more responsibility to Linux. And by this you can start where with a lot of elements in this safety critical part. And yeah, so that's the main thing on this part. Uh, and the last message is very important for me. It's not that you consider your watchdog in this design as being there or need to be there. You basically start creating your system that you never need to trigger the watchdog because you don't want this. This is just your system functionality and it has to work. And in best case, this gets not triggered into a safe state. For a telltale use case, for example, this could mean uh, that the screen is turned off or that you do a restart, basically you would maybe make a black screen or so that people directly recognize the driver, oh, it's not going right here. It could be also beep a warning message or what else, but depending on what's your safety process, you need to make sure that this is really also triggered so their safety criticality comes in picture again. I prepared a one minute video, but I never know how these kind of things properly work if you do a demonstration, so I just put the YouTube link on the material and uh, if you're brave enough, or even not, I guess it's a nice and straightforward thing, um, we have a good documentation how to experience this demo because when we started with the ELISA work, we saw that um, yeah, we basically started building our topics from scratch. 
we documented everything right good as best on understanding and then someone came and said well but I'm not using Ubuntu I'm using an OpenSUSE tumbleweed and uh, we figure, oh, we need a little bit more maybe, that we have more environments set up that people can reproduce things. So we came up with a Docker container, uh, which basically gets the things, packages installed, which you need the right version of it to make it easier for people. Then the next thing we observed was, oh, okay, the people do a Yocto build. Yocto consumes a lot of space and a lot of compilation. Maybe the cache binaries would be a good option. And so we also enabled the S state in there so that you cannot, uh, can now build like an the parts which are still buildable or needed to be built in roughly 40 minutes on a poor laptop. It basically depends on your download speed also, right? It's quite amount of download which you typically have with the Octobuild. Um, on the long run, we also see if we can extend it to other systems that we have maybe also Debian version of it or so, but for now it's the Octo star. The last thing which we figured out, there are also use cases maybe where you want to deep dive into the system and this would be the complementing part to this demo. If you don't want to see the video and you want to just try it out directly, uh, if you have QM on your system installed, just download the bi binaries directly. They get built nightly, so really nightly. So every night you get a new one. Uh, it always goes to the latest version of the AGL. We had a little bit of problems last week, but it's up and running again. Uh, it does a build check, does a boot check so that you can really experience it. And it basically uses the instructions which are written down in the GitHub readme markdown file. Right, yeah, this is about this. Uh, some next steps, the STPA is continued, so we're getting into deeper levels of it. We uh, need to see that we get the workload tracing properly reflected in the different diagrams. This was heavily driven by the medical devices work group. The automotive has not used the workload tracing that much, but we bring this in there. The call tree also got extended with another tool, which was uh, KS, called KSNAV, does certain kernel static navigation tools so you get a better analysis and better view on this. Um, yeah, for the Meta Eliza, as I was talking about QMO, everybody wants to see real hardware, so we also are on a pass on bringing this on an ARM-based hardware for now. So we have the x86 since QMO simulation and an ARM underneath. This is mainly driven by systems work group. And what is very important so far, this display checking in there, so we are not Normally you would check what the rendering of a telltale, but there are so many different kind of implementations so that we mock a lot of things there and we want to improve this so that we have proper display checks and also a lot of monitoring. This is basically on the four topics which we have seen. Uh, additionally, we work on a system SBOM. We enabled the SBOM part for generating material in the demo. Uh, we want to improve kernel configuration, trim down the size of the image, then uh, have the RT documentation updated, have more complex cluster demo involved, and that's mainly it. So summarizing what you have seen, uh, we talked about the challenges in the beginning. Basically, what the difference between the traditional safety critical RTOS and the new one, what's this is what the collaboration can and what cannot achieve. You heard about the goals and the way of the strategy, which tools we analyzed or which, which elements we looked into. And also then uh, you could see how the different work groups interacted, how they put into a system, how we outreach to wider community parts. I talk about the contributions of the different work groups, what is shared with the community, also in form of uh, usable use case, downloadable. Then you could see methodologies about STPA, um, workload tracing. And lastly, uh, we got a little bit of view on what's coming next. And I guess we're good from the timing from the questioning part. Uh, does anyone have a question? So there's one above coming down. You have a question. Okay. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned certification uh, as one big problem. So uh, where uh, can we ch uh, improve things so that certification processes become more open source friendly and open source software becomes more certification friendly? So what has to be done or, or can be done there? Yeah, I, I guess some part from a certification. So you're asking how can uh, open source and certification come closer to each other from both sides, right? 
And um, one thing could be, for example, done in the documentation in improving tracing down, having tools supporting how do certain features get from the mailing list into the system if there's a test around it. So this gives a lot of confidence and trust in what it's doing. Um, from another perspective, there's not much in the safety integrity standards which allow the usage of pre-existing software elements. So for this, there's also an ISO pass currently which allows more usage. I mean, it depends on the safety standard which you're in. If you're some relaxed medical standards, it's less requirements on this, but for automotive, it's very strong and prohibitive on this. Um, so I would say doing careful work and explaining design decisions and so on, making this visible and more structured, having maybe centralized bug tracking and so on. This, this can help a lot from this perspective. It will be good for the certification authorities. And we do a lot of clearance also. Yeah, you see, I guess if I heard you correctly said from supporting the um, assessments and authorities in there, we also have uh, company support where we really are in the working groups and get from certification authorities input in the continuous work which we are doing, so they are directly working within the work groups as well. Yeah. Chin as well. Thank, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I had, a, I had a, just a quick question. I want to get a feel for what your opinion on, on this is. Um, do you think there's space as um, a certification for, for something like Linux improves can, can, and Can you move the mic a little bit closer? Because it's for me, I hear the people louder leaving. So just oh, a little bit. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I see the difference. Um, as as, um, as a process for certification and for validation of uh, Linux kind of improve and, and change over time. Do you think there's ever going to be space for, for Linux to be used in, in kind of a critical component on vehicles, or do you think that space is n completely reserved for, for something that's actually using real time? Uh, the main part which I heard was if there's, I got the real time part in the end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, like, do you think there is? It's already there. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll take it. Was it there? Some Does anyone else have a question? Pending. You have a question. Yeah. Um, so, what is the place for Linux itself in, um, let's say, what's the safety integ and integrity level of Linux itself in this model? Because if you take, let's say, ISO 26262, um, there's a V-model requirements for development, this, but Linux already has source code. There are no, you know, there is no coverage, this test with all this MCDC coverage, etc., etc. So what's the place of Linux and how to keep it, maintain it without forking? Yeah, so um, you say where's the space in the place of Linux? If you see the V-model, for example, for the ISO 26262, where does things fit in? There are a lot of demands like... Uh, car, car, coverage parts, tracing, and so on. So what you can see is that, um, first of all, speaking about a level, you will not directly go to an ASLD level, which puts much more requirement on the tools. That's for sure. So you should start on a lower ASL AB level. That's also what we did. Uh, we relaxed some part also for automotive cases. So let's don't start with too complex part. Let's maybe get a real-time criticality out there, because then you have to review much more parts. And um, so the space which I see is that you should argue equivalence for certain things, that you are in close collaboration with assessors and explain how things are done. Because when the ISO was originally prepared, it was not considering a complex system as Linux being in use and the large amount of pre-existing software. So from this, if you are in an assessment, if you are there, if you can show and show the credibility by requirements work, by good concepts, you may in the first end come up which, to a system which is arguably be safe, but not directly certifiable to your ISO 262 part. But uh, this already shows you the perfect discussion room also, right? Because then you see, well, you cannot tell me this is not working 
but you still say it's not certifiable, and then you see also the, the glitch of the standard. And if you reach this point, you have a lot of good support when you go with our certification authorities early, if you have internal assessments and you can judge it, and in the end it's also your responsibility where you say, oh, I argue for an equivalence, because it's not saying in the spec you have to, it says recommended, highly recommended, leaving you also trace for showing equivalence to this model. I'm using this, and on top I'm adding this, and by this you can get an argument. And of course, getting feedback from your developers that the work which you're doing goes also into kernel mainline and so on. So maybe also it's possible to somehow affect how ISO 2622 yeah. is yeah. developed because it's a bit outdated in some way. Some of the members in ELISA have people in these ISO committees that are basically taking it back into that direction for the future revs of the standards. I d we don't have visibility, at least I don't because I'm not in those committees, but we do know that um, some of those member companies you saw up there um, are there and they are advocating for things to work a little bit better in future revs. Okay, is there anyone else who has a question? Uh, okay, well, well then thank you for your talk. Um, Thanks a lot.